Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Tim, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some of my learnings over the last, uh, uh, I guess, 10, 15 years uh, of doing distributed systems, uh, both operating, designing, and building them, uh, particularly within large enterprise companies. So uh, first thing I'm going to be talking about is uh, conversion and immutable infrastructure. Uh, just a quick recap on those for those people who may or may not be familiar. Um, but for most of our time together, I'm going to be talking about online experimentation, uh, what it is, uh, and design trade-offs, and different ways that we can make it work, uh, operational complexity trade-offs, and so on. So we've only got about 35 minutes together, so we're going to get started, as we've got quite a bit to get through. So immutable infrastructure, what is it? So it's the practice of replacing software components rather than upgrading them in place. Machines should not be long-lived. Uh, they instead should be dynamically provisioned from fixed images and destroyed as needed. Application systems, they're versioned, and then they're replaced uh, with newer versions as time passes. Operators, like the ops team, can uh, move environmental conditions around the application, uh, but the application itself should never have changed or deviate from the, the build time artifact. So typically, this is a container or a virtual image in some environments. So converged infrastructure. So for the purpose of this talk, what I specifically do not mean is hyper-converged infrastructure that some storage vendors might be talking to you about at the moment. It's kind of buzzwordy. So I specifically do not mean that. So instead, uh, I'd like to draw uh, your attention to the high degree of unutilized resources uh, that most data centers carry in industry today. So traditional ideas around compute environments, uh, you know, they create physical barriers sort of in our virtual world. Firewalls, networks, racks, so forth. Uh, so in this case, a traditional stage or development environment uh, versus a production environment, servers are literally separate. Uh, most stage machines may only ever receive a very small fraction of any uh, amount of traffic uh, versus the production environment. Uh, they cost the same. You, you pay the same or the same. So whilst these partitions, they were added typically to provide security or perceived security, uh, perceived sandboxing, uh, they actively prevent a high degree of resource consumption. Uh, this will forever couple us to a solution space that sort of doesn't really take into account, uh, in my opinion, how technology has evolved. So when resources are statically provisioned in this manner, uh, it doesn't really matter if you run on a public cloud like GCP or AWS, um, or instead, if you run in your own data center, you're either paying for VM time or you're paying on electrical and uh, depreciation in your capital investment. So in most installations, dedicated machines, they only ever run a fractional load average. You're literally wasting money. Now, I, I don't really blame anyone for this situation, to be honest. Uh, its evolution makes complete sense. If we consider for a moment the relationship between application developer and data center operator uh, over the past decade uh, or more, uh, the product people have typically had to work directly with the operators, ask them for the machines. The operators then go, go and rack and stack uh, and do whatever uh, essentially was needed to satisfy the request. And then they make a note of who they put them in for, and that's mostly that you know, until there's some kind of outage. Now, the data center team don't want the product people poking around with SSH, and the product people, frankly, have better things to be doing. So this sort of mode of operation doesn't really serve anybody particularly well. So if we fast forward to the current day, as all of you know, you're here at HashiConf, uh, we see this blossoming middle sector uh, and this field of what I like to call infrastructure engineering has provided tools to sort of fuel what people call the so-called DevOps revolution. So this empowers both sides of that previous relationship. Data center operators now focus on hardware, and they keep the site running, uh, whilst product engineering folks uh, deliver business value, making use of those self-service tools. And I think it's these very tools that allow us to rethink how we operate uh, our systems. We no longer have to be beholden to those dedicated machines. Instead, we can see our fleet as one uniform pool of resources. And so if we imagine what that looks like, it kind of looks like this. All the yellow squares would be like our machines, and we have a scheduling substrate. Now, in this case, HashiConf. So we just heard a good talk by Alex talking about Nomad. Uh, so Nomad would be one example of a scheduling substrate. Mesos would be another. Kubernetes is another. So on and so on. There are many different products for these things. But the point is, you're decoupling the people who own the data center versus those who operate workloads on top of it. And it turns out that these users are actually quite demanding. They need very fast iteration. They don't want to wait. They don't want to wait 20, 30 minutes for a VM to be provisioned. They want to iterate on, on models and things in production. They need a high degree of observability. They want, need to know what's going on. If you say no SSH access, then they need logs. They need metrics. They, they need all their monitoring. They need tracing. 
I need seamless application revision migration. So if I'm on version one and I have version two, I need to be able to shift all the traffic, provide observability into all that, make sure they know what's going on. And last but not least, uh, all this has to be self-service, and it has to be completely, absolutely automated. There should be no manual intervention for any of these steps. And the thing is, is that all of these are just the table stakes. Like, we haven't even got to anything interesting. And I kind of feel like failing to have these tools sort of dooms an organization sort of manual access and human-bound processes. And this kind of represents a pretty large business risk for any given organization. Manual process is typically a crutch for automation avoidance. Um, and so I like to think that if we can automate everything we can, if we don't, what we fail to automate becomes encoded in our organizational folklore, uh, essentially communicated by person to person with word of mouth. It's fundamentally sort of not scalable. So the, gut, the guts of the talk, experimentation, what well, hopefully most of you are here to, here to hear about. So more often than not, our gut feelings and intuition, they mislead us. Uh, as humans, we struggle with, to effectively assess the value of any given idea. We think that what we think may be an expected outcome often turns out to be entirely wrong. So being able to objectively compare uh, expectations and outcomes can prove to be the sort of innovation accelerator within a given organization. If teams feel like trying something new is pretty low cost, safe, and measurable, experimentation can really become this, this sort of part of engineering organization's social fabric. If it's okay to trial, it's okay to try, and it's okay to fail. It's really important. Now, this is an operational conference uh, with a lot of ops people and you know, so on. So, so most of us just like to call that testing in production. So, um, so here with, we're going to start talking about testing in production. So well, as I was preparing for this talk, I found this really great tweet from Jerry Majors. Uh, it says, easy failures should always be caught by tests. For anything ultra complicated, you pretty much have to test it in production. And she is 100% right about that. So let's talk about testing in production. Everybody's done it. Nobody wants to own up to it. So if you've ever done a rollback in production because something went differently to how you expected, you've tested in production. An experiment, if you will. <laughs> so many engineers find themselves in the sort of false sense of security. When their test suites pass, they're often surprised at the sort of interesting things that go wrong in the production, in the production environment. So unit and functional tests, they really are on this sort of first layer of testing. They seldom cover the wide variety of things that can go wrong particularly with systems at scale. So let's talk about some of these things. One of my favorite is this concept of emergent behaviors. So our distributed systems are more complicated than ever. Microservices have caused an explosion in complexity. And they make service contracts and availability of peer systems harder than ever to reason about. And there are two laws which I think are sort of codify this. The intersection of these laws are kind of you know, what produces emergent behaviors. So the first is Conway's law. Any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Anyone who works in a company that has more than 100 people will absolutely be familiar with this. Organizational siloing, you know, simply not knowing what other parts of the organization are doing as a product of your size. And the second is Hiram's law. With a sufficient number of users of an interface, all observable behaviors of your interface will be depended upon by somebody. Now, if we think about this in the context of microservices, what we typically see is if I'm in one group and there's a service in another group, and I don't really know them, but I know they provide this service. Uh, they may have five APIs. Uh, three of them might be like, highly optimized for like, their heavy read workflow that that service was designed for. Then they might have two write workflows, or sorry, two write workflows for sort of administration piece. Now, from my perspective, I don't know them. I just see the interface they publish. So I go, oh, OK, great. The two write APIs are the ones that I need because they need to ingest data into the system. And so I call them. Maybe I call them too aggressively. And maybe I take the system down because I didn't talk to them. I didn't know. And so I feel like this is often the intersection of these two laws is often where a lot of our complexity in microservice systems and it's emergent behaviors that we see in, in, in systems come from, things that are misused properly or many, many different cases, but all social problems. So when we talk about microservices, what nearly always comes up is containers. And one of the supposed benefits of containers is sort of this advantage of local testing. And I think that's a complete fable. So it works on my laptop is not really a useful endorsement of pretty much anything. And most, list, most systems, if, if, I, if I consider a, a typical service with a database, maybe I've got five of those said services, each with their own database, it's not going to fit on my laptop. I only have eight gigabytes of RAM. 
Now, I could get a bigger laptop, but I would only buy myself certain headroom. If I consider that most microservice architectures end up having hundreds or thousands of services, local testing is a debunked myth. So many production systems, they have average, low average volumes of traffic, but they have massive peaks in traffic. Twitter is notorious for its fail whale outages in the early days. Those kind of user-generated, unpredictable traffic peaks literally made them victims of their own success. It would surely only take one cute cat meme to bring down Twitter. Joking aside, this is the world we live in. These peaks and troughs are something that we have to adapt to. There are more people with more devices online than ever, and it's not decreasing anytime soon. So we need to develop strategies to effectively handle and scale these kind of problems. Last but not least, uh, and this is one of my favorite, by the way, it's human error. It, we, we can automate, we can do many things, but we're still human. We make so many mistakes. There was a really great study out of Facebook uh, that conducted a, they conducted a study, and it showed that their most stable system was actually present on the week of Christmas and the week their yearly, re yearly reviews were due for submission. The stability of the system was directly inverse to the number of developer change sets being applied. The more they worked on it, the worse it got. You know, so it's kind of interesting that that happens, and I think most organizations can relate to that sentiment in one way or another. Businesses, uh, they pri it's highly prized to have high-velocity developer parallelism. Uh, it's coveted by most. If, and despite this comes at the cost of, sort of overall system stability in many cases, sort of, it's OK to move fast and break things, but move faster and fix things. Now, with all this being said, the concept of experimental testing in production is not a new one. We can look towards a lot of prior art, Specifically, the papers and publications from the likes of Google and Amazon and Microsoft, among many others, they form the foundation of much of our sort of industry knowledge about experimentation systems. Microsoft's Bing experimentation system is one of the largest in the world, it has over 200 currently running ex concurrently running experiments. They expose about 100 million users to billions of Bing variants every single day. And I think that's a really staggering sort of statistic. Now, if I think about different these different companies all operate in different market sectors. If you're an ad company, you care about transaction rates or impression rates and targeting. If you're an e-commerce store, you care about your transaction rates. Why aren't people buying things? If you're, a, if you're a telecoms company, you care about why are people calling my call center? Why, have I got, you know, why are people returning my product? All of these kind of things make a huge difference. And so regardless of the paper or, or prior art that you're looking at, a fundamental tenet of the concept of experimentation is this idea of segmentation. That is, from your total population, indicated here by the outer circle, you take a subset group and use them for testing. And so within that test group, half the participants will be in experimental control, where no changes are applied. They get the vanilla experience, whatever that is. And the other half are your treatment group. That is, that which receive a modified experience in some way. So when we talk about segmentation, uh, people often think about making groups like males aged 20 to 30 or something along those lines, uh, which is sort of nearly never what you want. Experimentation typically works best with random application. Uh, even, the slightest targeting, even the slightest targeting uh, can subtly skew your results in one way or another. For example, let's consider that you, you conducted an experiment and you randomly filled your, uh, your, buckets of, your segment buckets uh, with participants between 10 a.m. and noon. And maybe it's for a consumer device like a TV or something. So whilst your participants are indeed random, uh, you've introduced an inherent bias. It's highly probable that most people will be at their place of work during those hours. And so you've accidentally, accidentally introduced participants with a very similar demographic profile. And so with this frame, it's really important to appreciate that the nuance that comes with segmentation and targeting for experiments. Uh, if you introduce any kind of bias, you have to be absolutely sure to eliminate that, uh, or at least account for it when you're interpreting those results. So we know that we need a segment of the population. That is, there has to be some threshold, which is defined ahead of time by some operator uh, to specify what the experiment needs. So for example, I need 100,000 users. I need a million users, something like that. So the first thing we need to figure out is, is this inbound request from a user that's already part of an experiment or not? Should it be part of an experimental segment? Maybe we exclude a certain category of customers because they're very high value, and then we account for that bias. Whatever we do, this is typically done by having an edge system intercept that call, uh, reach out to a segment assigner, and then make that decision. 
Naturally, there are optimizations that can be done here to avoid a call on each and every request from the user. Uh, but for the simplicity of this talk, we'll just assume that we call every time. Now, the segment assigner then has a sort of very low round trip latency budget uh, in which to figure out if those experiments that are currently uh, ongoing require additional participants or not. And any outstanding experimental buckets can then be filled in sort of random order uh, until they meet that specified participant threshold. So if I've got three experiments that I need to fill, I'm just going to randomly fill them, um, you know, rather than trying to do any fancy like uh, uh, you know, bit bucketing or anything like that. Again, we don't want to introduce any sort of random bias. So inbound requests flow to the edge. They optionally get assigned to a segment. And then they propagate that experiment or segment handle throughout the system topology. This is probably the hardest part of, of experimentation for most organizations, as it requires that you have buy-in from pretty much all the service owners in a given call chain. If you're already supporting something like Open Tracing, Jaeger, or Zipkin, it's highly likely that you have you know, some kind of context that you propagate around. So bolting on that experimental context uh, is probably pretty low impact. If, however, you don't have distributed tracing, um, you can use the addition of tracing as kind of like a, a nice incentive, a carrot, if you will, uh, you know, to get people to change their code and adopt your experimental system. Last but not least, every single system wishes, uh, every single sy system wishes to participate in an experiment uh, need to publish their telemetry, publish the outputs, tag with a segment handle so that analysis can differentiate those various data points. Now, this diagram shows the telemetry being Google Cloud PubSug, it could easily be Kafka, a monitoring solution, or even just plain old logs. It, it doesn't really matter. The key thing is that you've got to re record that behavior and export it to a point of analysis. It may be that you have multiple sources you know, contributing to that overall analysis, uh, but the overall design is the same. Make sure you export and tag that data so you know exactly where it came from. Was it the control or was it the treatment? Now, now we know how our experimentation workflow could work. Uh, we need to address some of the practical matters. Uh, that actually get participants into our experimental systems. So typically, and I'm sure many people in this room will be familiar with these kind of canary deployments. I admit, I, I've got my 1.1.1 version. I deploy 1.1.2, and then I, I can continue to replace machines up until the point I've replaced them all. I actually consider this pretty harmful. Um, I think the unit of work is simply too large. A modern Linux machine can handle thousands of connections or millions of connections. So the scope or speed of my experiment, I, I don't want it to be governed by the operational choices uh, you or someone else made. It lacks granularity. Uh, and whilst this, work, this has worked for quite some time with sort of varying degrees of mileage for different organizations, I kind of don't think it's the, the ideal solution. Uh, so granular traffic splitting is sort of a much better alternative, in my opinion, to canary machines. And this allows operators to push and pull traffic around their topology at a rate that makes sense for their application. Right? Ramping up traffic on the new application revision as needed, uh, or pushing back to the older version uh, if the patch is not working out as intended. It's important to note that you know, we're, not, we're assuming that there's no multivariate testing here for anyone who's interested. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that later. So the benefits of this approach uh, are granularity and fine grained control uh, over, over an, a, a given experimental segment. Uh, but the downsides are that you need operational, res operational resource capacity so that you can run you know, the old one and the new one uh, scaled at the same time. In the vast majority of cases, this sort of doesn't prove to be too much of an issue, uh, as most clusters are over-allocated. Now, the next, mode, the next mode of experimentation is the idea of what I would refer to as sort of ad hoc experimentation. Typically speaking, uh, you might have engineering staff who want to deploy something and sort of poke around or otherwise run some integration tests themselves to ensure that you know, when their new code is, is deployed, that it works sort of as they intended. And this is what sort of per request routing gets you. A request is sent from the user with some context, for example, a header, intercepted at the edge, and then forwarded to the appropriate internal service, no matter, which, no matter how deep it is in the call chain. Um, and so this, this kind of flexibility is extremely useful for that sort of dev testing or QA style testing. Uh, but it's sort of na naturally not a scalable solution for production. But it's, it's nevertheless a very useful use case. To be able to silently deploy something in production and then access it so only you can access it, it's very useful. So the astute audience member may have noticed that the previous two strategies only work for systems that are internal to my, my service topology. Um, and the edge component uh, is handling request interception and delegating to the appropriate downstream. 
So this presents a specific problem for edge systems, as it would turn out. Um, and as a way, we need to work with these, uh, assuming we can't just go to the, the teams that run the edge systems and say, hey, no experimentation for you folks. Um, you know, we need to think, what can we do about it? So in this case, uh, one strategy uh, would be to use good old DNS and flip-flop between endpoints. And this can work in some cases if you fully control the client. Um, but by and large, uh, you know, it's kind of suboptimal. It may be if you're a phone app or a POS or somewhere where you don't control the client, you don't control how or when updates are applied, um, you know, it's not that great. Now, you could mitigate it with, like, the device polling an SRV record or something similar, you know, but those strategies kind of start to fall down in low-power environments like IoT, uh, where background processes are severely limited uh, due to low power or connectivity restraint. So instead of using DNS at the edge, I think a better and more robust solution is to use sort of this idea of edge trees or, you know, tree proxies. So this means that you have a stable, consistent DNS point for clients to call, uh, so no update is required, and you can split and shift traffic uh, from that common entry point. So whilst this diagram only shows the tree to like one level, uh, there's nothing stopping you from having as many, you know, many, many levels in the tree as you need uh, with various points of splitting and delegation. Uh, the important thing to note here is that these two, these two edge systems can make use of common internal systems. You're not building an entirely new world. You're simply allowing experimentation at the edge of the system. So I think whilst this can be quite effective, uh, you need to be aware that, of course, you're paying a small, a small latency cost here in terms of the network ops. So I think you need to be careful to, to mitigate, uh, mitigate, mitigate that latency increase uh, by co-locating those ingress points as close to your edge system as you can. So last but not least, an experimentation strategy that probably is familiar to those who've worked on monolithic deployments, uh, internal code path changes that make use of inbound request context and then they figure out which functions they need to call uh, based on that. So broadly speaking, I think the other strategies we just discussed, they're superior. Uh, but in, there are a few cases where this is sort of still sometimes a more viable option. I think specifically when conducting sort of data-bound experiments, such as you need to try out a different storage model, or perhaps you're even trying a different database, whatever it happens to be, the application has to have some kind of knowledge that you're trying to conduct that kind of uh, experiment. And with that being said, I do think it's rare, but if, if it's used excessively, it can get totally out of hand. As from a management perspective, uh, engineers are not sure which experimental paths in the code they can safely remove. Like, so that kind of results in them never removing any uh, and you know, accruing this sort of immense amount of technical debt. So those are a few different strategies for experimentation on the server side. And there are indeed several other strategies that we haven't discussed, uh, but I'll largely focus on these as I think uh, you know, there's never been a better time to embrace building these kind of experimental systems on the server side. Uh, so we have more building blocks for routing, scheduling, workload mobility than ever before. And so in the next few slides, we'll talk about uh, some of those things that are available and how you can use some of those pieces to build your own experimentation system. So the first, obviously, is the scheduling substrate. Um, this is probably one of the most well-known elements, so I won't spend too much time on it. The space has kind of absolutely exploded in the last few years. Nomad, Kubernetes, Mesos, uh, to name but a few of the available options. And I think each system gives you pros and cons. Um, we've decided to do a couple of different things at work. And I think if you can containerize your application right now, or if you cannot containerize your application right now, then perhaps Nomad or Mesos will make sense. Um, likewise, if you're not familiar with resource managers or you don't want to write your own scheduler uh, and you want more of a pass-like experience, maybe Kubernetes is a better fit. Point is, you need to objectively look at your own requirements, look at your own organization, and make an informed choice. Uh, I would definitely encourage you not to follow the hype. Uh, all of these products have various different uh, uh, trade-offs. Uh, I've run Nomad and, and Mesos uh, at scale uh, for in production for a number of years, and it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see the trade-offs. So if anyone's interested, I can talk to you about that afterwards. So the data plane. The data plane is the part of the infrastructure that's responsible for routing those requests uh, to and from different parts of our topology. Now, there are varying, various proxy technologies that are available today. Some old, some new, uh, but the real difference with these modern variants uh, is their sort of ability to integrate you know, with a so-called control plane. Envoy is sort of leading the herd, in my opinion. Uh, has mass investment from, from Google, IBM, Lyft, uh, and even just actually a couple of weeks ago, Nginx uh, said that they had started to support some of the same control plane APIs, uh, meaning we could end up seeing a standard for these kind of control plane APIs and hopefully standardize for experimentation. That would be awesome. Um, other options in this space are Linkerd, uh, Nginx Plus. Uh, you know, there are various different things that you could do. Um, but again, look at your requirements, see what you need, 
make, make objective choices. Now, if you're going to run this, how does it actually look? So in terms of operating th that data plan, there are potential sort of innumerable different configurations. So I'll just talk about three, because it's kind of the three that like, many people kind of jump to, talk about some of the different trade-offs. So in this case, we've got some machine. Uh, Nomad is my scheduling substrate. Console is my, uh, my service catalog. I've got some container deployed on some node, some allocation. And I've literally got Envoy embedded inside my container. This works. Uh, you know, works for most people. Uh, the problem is, is that you, start, you then are unable to reason about resource consumption for, for Envoy versus your application. And you know, then before I know it, you need like, you know, logging and several other things. So it's kind of a slippery slope. Easy to get started, but it kind of falls down. I guess a more Kubernetes-style way of doing it, a pod for anybody who's familiar, is sort of to run this thing as a sidecar. In nomad parlance, this is a task group with multiple tasks inside a task group. Um, and so what that means is that when it comes to scheduling, uh, those two containers are discreetly scheduled on the same machine. And then they basically have, uh, uh, let's say it's running in bridge mode, they both, they both have the same, uh, uh, they, they both know about each other's IP port combinations on that bridge. So we can do this. This has some benefits. If we decided, for example, that we wanted to do a mass update of the Cypher suites that we supported. Uh, we could simply roll through the cluster operationally without anybody knowing uh, and update all the Envoy sidecars to update their SSL configuration. That's really a very nice pro. The upper is obviously that we're running more containers. We have slightly more complexity. There are more moving parts. Um, so again, no perfect solutions, just different trade-offs. The last this is host-based Envoy or host-based data plane. I'm saying Envoy in these slides because that's the choices that I've made. But please don't, uh, uh, don't just assume that's the only way. I'm just highlighting this as a, you know, another way that you could possibly run the data plan. Now, in this case, host-based Envoy is kind of attractive. I have, uh, uh, I have only one thing on every host. So I only have as, as many, as many uh, parts of my routing infrastructure as I do machines. This is kind of nice. Uh, obviously, the downside is that in the case where I do have a problem with, with that data plan, then I'm actually essentially damaging QoS for every single application run on that, on that machine. And so uh, in many, in many uh, deployments of these kind of things, you end up with a high degree of tenancy. So um, you might have 80, 90, 100, 150 applications on a given host. So it, it, you know, it, becomes, it becomes unwieldy uh, to manage over time, is, would, be, would be my opinion. So we've talked about the data plan. Let's talk about the control plane, sort of the more interesting part, to be honest with you. Um, so th there are various different things that can be done that, that right now are available as open source or, or indeed commercial projects uh, uh, for a, a control plane. So Itzio, Linkerd, uh, Nelson. Uh, I guess a shameless self-plug, Nelson was open sourced by my group at Verizon. And um, uh, we, yeah, so it's open source, it's on GitHub. Go and check it out. It's, it's, if you're running HashiStack, it's, 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 it's really nice. But, so, this is essentially how the control plane works. The control plane basically sits there, and any orchestrator that you have, so whether or not it's Nelson, or whether or not it's Itzio, or, or whatever it happens to be, it's basically saying, I want, I want this traffic to go here, I want this, I want this, and, and setting all the constraints, like, like I need the Foo application version 1.1.1. Where is that thing? Translate that, that logical name into IP port combinations. Now it's got, they've all got different IPs, they've all got different ports, um, and so, this kind of control plane serves up that information. And so in many cases, what you can also do is you can do interesting things like automatic zone affinity. So if, if you, you're inbound and you say, hey, I'm like IP you know, 10, 10, 10, 10 kind of thing, um, and you know, we can say, OK, based on the IP, we know that that's in AZ you know, USD 1B kind of thing. And then you can only give it, you, can, you could give a response that prioritized those as things that it should, call, it should try and call first. And so there's all these interesting optimizations that you can do to sort of lower latency, increase, increase your, uh, your overall availability. Um, and so the other nice thing about this is that you can also, in conjunction with the control plane and data plane, you can, um, um, you can get automatic encryption. So there's this sort of very nice thing that happens, which is uh, if my application makes a request, um, I can dynamically, um, even transparently to the application, they make a dumb HTTP request. Then in the data plane, I can say, OK, Take that request, encrypt it, wrap it in mutual TLS, and then I, I can have vault provision, dynamically, dynamic credentials for every single container in my entire platform, where every single container has unique credentials, unique certificates, uh, and, and all the traffic is being encrypted on the wire. So I can, uh, you probably, for those who are in the keynote this morning, saw namespaces. So even if, even if I'm in the same namespace, I still get privacy for my application, and I can get that in a, a really automated way. So we do this nice thing 
uh, from the control plane in Nelson, which is that when users deploy a new application, um, so they had version 1.1.1 and they deployed version 1.1.2, um, we give them a choice, which is how would you like me to bleed your traffic? How would you like me to shift your traffic? Now, in some cases, they can choose a power curve. They could use a linear curve, which is the default. And you, know, you can do these kind of interesting things. So depending on your application, you might have different requirements. Point is, the control plane is just another means. It's, it's the main means with, by which you can control the traffic and workload mobility in your system. Now, it's, it's not all roses, you know? This stuff is not, not immediately easy to build. There's nothing I can give you that will just plug and play into all your legacy applications. Sorry. Um, there's this really nice law, I think, when it comes to anal analyzing how these things are working, uh, which is this Tywin's law, a piece of data or evidence that looks interesting or unusual, probably wrong. And, and we see this quite, uh, quite often. So it's really important to objectively measure, account for your own biases, and make sure that whatever you're doing, however you're experimenting, however you're comparing these things, that you know what the inputs and outputs are, you understand what the bias is, and you take an objective look at the analyses. In conjunction with this, that disparate, disparate data, whether or not you've got some stuff in Splunk, some stuff in, in Prometheus, some stuff in, in StatsD, some stuff in whatever, like, you need some way to holistically look at all that data. And for many organizations, particularly larger organizations, this becomes a problem over time. And it's sort of its whole engineering effort on its own to kind of coalesce this data to, to answer these kind of experimentation questions. So I understand it's, it's not easy for many organizations. Now, when it comes to observability, you want to make sure, in order to feed that analysis, that every single, piece, uh, every single piece of data that you're reporting is tagged with the segment identifiers. And yes, that, that does mean modifying all the applications, as we were discussing. And I think you know, I bring it up again because I really do feel like this is the biggest challenge. And there are many things we can do as infrastructure engineering to kind of incentivize uh, and help them migrate. But it, it still truly remains one of the hardest things. I do think that all the, despite this, these difficulties and despite the problems with doing that, I think doing this, these kind of systems has major impact on an organization. I think it can really build, a t really change the way that you work as an engineering organization. The bottom line is I think that experimentation infrastructure makes your workloads mobile. And that's sort of super, super useful for a variety of reasons. You know, both via the setting substrate and via fine-grained fine traffic control systems, this kind of tooling really empowers your organization uh, in a multitude of operational vectors. It doesn't matter if you're providing fine-grained security or enabling like, an overarching strategy like hybrid cloud. Being able to push and pull your traffic patterns within your network topology as needed, uh, perhaps it's an experiment, or perhaps it's just you're, perhaps you're fixing some late-night outage. It, it doesn't really matter. But having the flexibility to do that, the flexibility to move your workloads, the flexibility to move your traffic in a way that suits your business is really, really powerful. I think. So last but not least, just a sort of a final thought. I think whatever you decide to do, you need to make sure that it's fully automated. Like whether or not you're aware of it or not, someone in your organization is probably doing a lot of these things by hand. And you know, that's, that's a really difficult kind of a, a situation. So we want to try and empower them and empower the organization to make mistakes, learn from their mistakes, and sort of objectively compare, how was I then? How am I now? Um, I've got a few minutes, so I'll just share a couple of stories. Uh, just, just to kind of uh, inform some other people. So it's actually quite interesting. Um, once you start to do these experimentation systems, you can have uh, all sorts of interesting automation. Like you can say, OK, I had, the, I had the old one, and then I had the new one. And then I can say, OK, well, let's, let's automa automatically look at all the data like objectively and build a confidence score. And the system can say things like, I'm 86% confident this is better than the last one. And so then you can do automatic promotions. And then you don't need people going into whatever system it is to do a promotion. Like the concept of promotions can kind of go away. And you can instead fall back on, on fully automated testing, fully automated systems that are lights out to operate. Um, more often than not, our systems will heal themselves in the middle of the night when they go wrong. And you know they do go wrong. Um, but regardless of whether or not it's Nomad just rescheduling the work or um, our system, Nelson, shifting traffic away from the problem, uh, you know, this is really, really useful. Um, with that, uh, I understand we're not going to have Q&A. So if anybody does have any questions, I know we just covered a lot of ground. And this is all kind of uh, you know, perhaps a little vague. Perhaps it's useful for some. Uh, but regardless, uh, thanks very much for having me. And if anybody's got any questions, I would love to talk to you on the side afterwards or, or find me in the corridor. Thank you very much, everybody.